Welcome to Privacy Abbreviated, brought to you by BBB National Programs and Osana. As our regular listeners know, our goal here is to really help business leaders prepare and operationalize for what's next in the privacy space. I'm Donna Frazier, Senior Vice President of Privacy Initiatives at BBB National Programs, and today I welcome a new co-host, Arlo Gilbert, the CEO and founder of Oslano. Thanks, Donna. It's great to be here today. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Osano is a data privacy compliance software company. And uh, quite frankly, I think we are the perfect hosts for today's conversation about data health privacy. Totally agreed. Most of us are aware that the use and disclosure and of health-related data held by doctors and insurance companies is regulated by Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, what we all call and know as HIPAA. However, we now live in this world where we have wearable devices, online services, and health and wellness apps where the data collected and used is not covered by HIPAA. And great attention is being paid to these developers and products. In addition to the draft federal privacy bill, the ADPPA, which is the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, that may resurrect itself in 2023. Uh, And that gives consumers a lot more control over their personal data. The FTC, Federal Trade Commission, has stated its intention to broadly interpret the health breach notification rule. Today's speakers are from Flow Health, a female health and wellness app that is the number one most downloaded female health app worldwide. And we've got with us today Timofe Savikti, Chief Legal and Compliance Officer, and Roman Bugayev, Chief Technology Officer. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. So um, let's start with the basics. Can you just briefly describe the flow period and ovulation tracker mobile app and how long you've been in the market, please? Yeah, sure. So we are number one OBGYN recommended app for period and cycle tracking. This is based on survey among United States OBGYNs. We already have over 240 millions of people who have downloaded flow. And out of those 220 millions, 48 million people use it on a monthly basis. So basically, we are the world's biggest health and fitness application by active audience. And our mission is to build a better future for female health, an area of healthcare that has been historically underlooked and underserved. And basically, we were founded in 2015. But since then, we've created a very good application. And basically, we started as a simple cycle tracking, and now we are much more than that. And basically, we are here to support women's worldwide. We are in the the mission to make a better future for them. Thank you, Roman. Um, Tima Faye, do you want to speak to how you've seen this space evolve even in the last five years? In terms of privacy and security, and I guess that's the core topic of our discussion today, obviously the landscape, the regulatory landscape has changed significantly over the last couple of years, and therefore all the products on the market react appropriately in order to address these challenges. Interesting. In uh, in 2021, you, Flo, uh, entered into a settlement agreement with the FTC about some of the claims that Flo wasn't upholding its stated data collection and sharing promises. Although I know we're not going to spend a huge amount of time talking about this, could, could you provide a little bit of background on the case? And then uh, I think most importantly, you know, what lessons did you learn through the process? Absolutely. And just to uh, reiterate this and reconfirm again and again, Flo has never sold any data to any third parties at any point in time and will never sell data to any, to any third parties. Uh, Flow used as most businesses in the field, third-party processors for internal purposes only. Uh, And of course, more information can be found about the kind of the the settlement and our position online. We have a statement available on our website. But the main and the core issue, I guess, to underline here is that following the settlement uh, with the FTC, which was not an admission of any wrongdoing, but rather a settlement, meaning that we decided not to bring this further and settle the, the claims. So we completed um, an external and independent review of all privacy pal- policies with, uh, uh, with an independent auditor. And the audit took place in March 2022, quite, quite, quite recently, uh, in the beginning of this year. And the independent audit found that our own practices, uh, policies are consistent with our publicly stated privacy policy. And the culture of privacy is heavily emphasized in flaw. 
and there are no material gaps and weaknesses in Floss privacy program. Awesome. I mean, one of the issues was regarding how data was being shared with third parties. And so your flow wouldn't be the first company to find themselves challenged with how to manage all that third party risk and the third party vendors and partners. And it seems pretty top of mind for a lot of companies these days. In light of that settlement, how have you reassessed how you work with third party vendors? I wouldn't call it, let, let's not depict pick the word reassessment, but rather uh, we used to have and we still have a very solid and uh, comprehensive vendor due diligence process in place which covers lots of uh, fields from general legal uh, matters to very in-depth price and security questions. So we make sure that every vendor, every processor that we use for, I don't know, storing the data or helping us with particular data processing operations, it undergoes very strict and very serious scrutiny from the experts in internal experts in price and security field. I would even say that internally some business owners and business units they even blame us for having a very very long and sophisticated questionnaire for for all the vendors <laughs> well we, you know we've we've heard this from a, a, a lot of companies and i think that uh it's good when your regulatory team is uh, occasionally having to say no to things so i'm i'm curious you know when when you're engaging with third parties what do you require from them so you talked about having a questionnaire but i mean what are you looking at when you're trying to ensure that they're meeting up your standards for data collection practices, which uh, sound like they're pretty rigorous? Good question, and thank you for it. Yeah, we ask lots of questions from whether there were any data breaches, whether a processor uh, is able to exercise the DSR requests on our behalf. That's one of the key issues, essentially, because we need to make sure that uh, where we onboard any vendor, this vendor is capable of, of deleting the data or exporting the data and doing all the instructions on our behalf. And generally, we are quite uh, keen to see publicly acknowledged uh, certifications and attestations, for example, ISO uh, certification reports or SOC uh, certification reports and all of that. Uh, probably Roman can comment more on security side, but from the price perspective, this would be the core issue, a so part of the other security, privacy, and me measures in place that vendors should have. You've kind of hit on my, my next question um, in talking about this in, in a global perspective. So obviously, flow is acceptable, is, is accessible outside the United States. And I was just recently traveling overseas and actually was sitting next to a couple of women who were actually talking about the app while they were using the app in the airport while we were waiting for our flight. How are you all managing this, the ever-changing global privacy landscape, right? I mean, we've talked about kind of what's happening here in the U.S. with the FTC, but how are you managing outside the U.S.? I would probably lie if I say that this is an easy exercise, but <laughs> internally, we maintain so-called GDPR plus approach. So GDPR is our golden standard that we extend to all people across the globe, meaning like we do not differentiate between various countries and provide the same level of protection to everyone. Of course, we adjust to local specifics and we account for local laws as well, but GDPR is currently a global standard for data protection and we make sure that we extend its provisions to all our user base. So under GDPR, there's a certain level of autonomy for users that we don't necessarily have here in the United States. So how are you managing retention of data, right? If if users want to retain their data, and obviously for the purposes of using the tracker, there's certain data they want to retain. So how much control do you give users over the retention and, and how are you just managing that? Full control. Any user at any time can request the deletion of data, export of data, correct, correct, um, rectification of data, let's use the correct language here, and all other DSRs that are stipulated in various laws across the globe. So is it on the back end, is the data anonymized or is it tied to a single user? Can you identify who the user is or is it all anonymized? Uh, yeah, I just want to say that like uh, basically while data is in use, it's connected to a particular user because basically, you know, like our app is very personalized and we use like user data to personalize experience of the user. And we use like historical data to predict cycles, like new kind of like future cycles of the women, or we use this data to personalize content inside the app and so on. So basically it's very personal uh, experience. 
But at the same time, if user requests a deletion, we just delete this data. So it's basically kind of, we maintain this very strict rules that, you know, like once user decided to leave our app and they don't want to have data inside our app, we just delete this. And we have very simple user kind of friendly way to, to access this, right? We have just a button, one click button inside the app where, um, and basically after this click, we delete this data. So have you had challenges with regards to how the definition of personal information is being defined versus sensitive personal information? Because there seems to be a, a distinction in some countries and in others that there isn't. So is, is there a conflict for you when you're dealing with sensitive information versus personal information? And for you all, is that all just in one bucket? Um, obviously, like the biggest bulk of information that we process about users, that's a sensitive health data because of the nature of our app. It could, it, it cannot be any, you know, different. And therefore, we maintain the highest possible, the strictest uh, standards in respect to all the data that we process. That's inevitable for, for such business as ours. So I'm really interested because you've got mobile applications, you've got a lot of health data, and your user base is worldwide. Does this present a lot of challenges around cross-border flow of information? I'm curious from a technical perspective how flows address that. So, yeah, for sure, it's a big challenge for us. Basically, you know, like most of our users, they're based in the United States and our infrastructure is also in the United States. So we use uh, cloud providers to store the data. And basically, this is, I think, it, it has certain advantages as well. So basically, you know, like when you store data in the cloud, there is very kind of good level of security because all those vendors, they invest heavily into security and, you know, like... Uh, we use all these best practices from cloud providers to protect the data. But, but for sure, like it's almost impossible to kind of localize data, you know, like in every country, in every kind of location where we have users, because basically there are so many countries in the world. Yeah, it's a big challenge. And here we rely a lot on non-technical things. So let's say, you know, like we try to explain this as clear as possible in our privacy policy. We obtain consent for data transfer if it's needed uh, and so on and so forth. But it's not very technical kind of things. It's more like a legal. From technical perspective, we try to minimize data collection as much as possible. Like when you don't have data, you don't transfer data. Yeah. So, so basically we collect only those data points that are absolutely necessary for us. And for sure, then we transfer them. But when we transfer them, we encrypt them in transfer at rest, you know, like it's like the whole journey of data point is completely kind of encrypted all the way from like mobile device to our servers. And also like when we store data, it's also encrypted and we control this. And uh, when we are talking about personal identifiable data, we try to double encrypt this data. Like basically we encrypt this on a database level. We encrypt inside database uh, the data points and so on. And also, we recently developed uh, an animals mode. And basically, this mode help us to make sure that data is completely unidentifiable. So basically, we don't have any personal identifiers like IP address or email or username. And basically, in this way, we have just data points that are not connected to a certain user. And in this way, we can make sure that like the data is super protected, let's say. Yeah. It's, it was quite a challenge, actually, to implement this mode because basically the modern internet is not designed for privacy. And, you know, like with every request, you have IP address. And IP address is actually, you know, like in modern world, you can find like a certain user based on IP address because basically, you know, like geolocation, you know, like a lot of other things. Every kind of device inside uh, modern homes, they have like unique IP addresses. And this was a, quite a challenge for us, how to decouple users data from IP address and we had to work with actually it was a quite journey uh, quite a journey for us and we worked with Cloudflare to kind of develop new internet standard which is called WS HTTP and basically in this standard we have a trusted middle party who removes the IP addresses and we don't see them but they don't see data and basically in this world like nobody really sees the data and user identifiers at the same time and this is one of innovations that we implemented to kind of protect users' data. 
and I'm happy to talk about this more, but <laughs> yeah, it's kind of just a few examples how we protect data uh, in modern world, I would say. Got it. Yeah, it sounds like uh, sounds like you're really going above and beyond, and and it is interesting because there's a panacea of perfect data localization around the globe that is is likely kind of unachievable by virtually any company. You mentioned your anonymous mode, and so you know we're we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I would love to understand kind of what prompted the development of the anonymous mode. Yeah, so basically, you know, like in the United States, in uh, post dots world the level of scrutiny on companies that are collecting data about females' health reproduction has greatly uh, increased. Yeah, and basically we are among those apps who collect a lot of data from female uh, users. And we had to react on this. And basically we heard uh, concerns from our users and we responded to those concerns and we implemented anonymous mode. And the whole idea here is to set a new standard for data privacy and security across all women's health apps. And we are the first comprehensive female health app uh, who takes this level of precaution in terms of privacy and security. And basically in in anonymous mode, uh, we ensure that no single party processing user data in anonymous mode has complete information on both who the user is and what they are trying to access. Anonymous mode allows any flow users the option to access the app without name, email address, any technical identifiers like IP address, IDFA, you know, like there are a lot of them in the world to track users. And basically in anonymous mode, we don't use them at all. And basically those identifiers are not associated with health data in the anonymous mode account. And to introduce a deeper layer of protection, Flow has partnered with Cloudflare and we implemented Oblivious HTTP In this mode, we ensure that no single party processing user data in anonymous mode has complete information who is the user and what is, uh, what they're trying to achieve or what they're trying to access inside the app. Is there a reason why it's just not possible for the data to be retained on the user's device as opposed to you all having it? Is there a logistical reason, technical reason that it just can't all be held on the user's device, which seems which would seem, in my opinion, to reduce liability for you all. So I'm just curious from a design perspective, why that's not possible. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about this. I think it's very important to say that a flow is not just a period tracker. We do much more than that. We have a lot of content. We have social network inside our app. We have uh, chatbot, virtual assistants. We have many, many features. And basically, it's very hard to implement all those features on a device especially if we are taking into account that there are a lot of users with low-end devices, you know, like old iPhone, old Android devices, you know, especially in countries where, you know, underdeveloped countries. Basically, you know, it's very hard to implement those features, especially as we are using a lot of machine learning, a lot of AI to when we implement those features. And, you know, like it's very hard to run those algorithms on devices. It's very expensive. And sometimes even impossible, yeah. So basically, if we want to build, you know, the best female app in the world, <laughs> we have to use uh, server side. For sure, like over time, it becomes easier and easier to implement features on device only. And whenever it's possible, we, we, we do our best to kind of not to collect data, to keep on device, or maybe even, you know, like to process the same data on device as well. But unfortunately, you know, it's, still quite a challenge. You know, it requires a lot of resources because basically we are available on uh, Android, we are available on iOS, we are available on the web. And basically, if we want to implement features, we need to kind of repeat the same work for every platform. But when we we implement those features on the server side, we can reuse the logic. And basically, in this way, all users across the world, they receive the best possible experience. So I think, you know, it's always trade-off, like, privacy versus cost user experience, you know, like, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, like for sure, like privacy is very important. And basically, you know, like we always think about privacy at design phase and we, every feature goes through very interesting journey when we think like what data is needed, what, what we can keep on device, what we need to collect and to store. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of features that are very hard to implement. And also I want to say that, you know, like, 
We also need to think about cases when user lost, for some reason, need to change a device and we need to transfer data from one device to another. There are some things how it's possible to do, like end-to-end encryption, like WhatsApp and so on did, but it's still quite a big challenge. Yeah, so... Yeah, it's my dream to kind of not to have this data on our servers because basically we can reduce, you know, like costs of our infrastructure. We can reduce amount of security folks that we have in our team <laughs> or in our company. But as of now, it's quite a challenge. But I see that, you know, like with all advanced, you know, like device become more and more powerful. So I believe that like in a few years, it will be possible to keep all data on device and to kind of process this completely on device. And I think this is the future, but meanwhile, we, we do our best to keep data protected on the server side. Yeah. I'll just ask one last quick question. And this one is near and dear to my heart because this is at the core of what my company does. But it's all about consent, right? That permission layer where we're, we're being transparent and we're, we're, we're making sure that we've got clear, conspicuous notice and all that kind of good stuff. So getting consent can be tough on the web, but in a mobile environment, that can be even more challenging. So I'm, I'm interested to understand how you're handling uh, notice and consent with your mobile applications. Yeah, thank you for, for the question. If you download the app and if you see one of the first screens that that, that on the onboarding, you will see a very detailed and long consent screen, which essentially provides users with a lot of information about how the data may be processed, links to the privacy policy and terms of use. So all the fine art related to uh, processing of personal data. Um, that's how we approach consents. And obviously, uh, as any company in the field, uh, we understand the power of micro consents or consents that are kind of presented in the right moment and kind of for the right processing activity. So therefore, that's probably one of the directions for, for us to move uh, to. Uh, in terms of privacy policy, we try to make it as user-friendly as possible. Uh, you can also see in our privacy policy all the oldest versions of the, of the privacy policy. You can access them through the link and sort of compare how the document has changed over the time. And we routinely refine the privacy policy to be user-friendly and understandable for, for users because we all know that sometimes privacy jargon may be quite difficult to comprehend and digest. So our task is to be as friendly to our users as possible and explain them in a simple and plain language. So with with the consent issue, undoubtedly you have a lot of children, and I'm going to use the word children broadly defined because right here in the United States under COPPA, a child is defined as under 13. However, states are defining children under 18. The proposed federal law here in the United States is also defining children under 17. We know under GDPR, it's a range between 13 to 16. Mm-hmm. How are you obtaining when necessary prior parental consent before you can collect the data of children? Good question. Um, and actually, uh, to answer this question, I would need to probably split it into the two categories in terms of in, in the two sort of points, sub points. In terms of COPPA, uh, we do not generally allow, and, and COPPA and GDPR, I would, I would put it in one bucket, uh, we do not generally allow children under 13 in the United States and 16 in Europe and UK under GDPR into the app. So we specifically ask for the age uh, of our users. And if we identify that they lie by, by, by kind of providing incorrect uh, age that is not corresponding to our minimum age that, that is allowed in the application, we normally block such users. That's our current approach. Of course, talks about possibly enabling the parental consent and all of that, but that's our position currently not to allow children in the app. In terms of broader category of, of teens or teenagers, obviously, there's a little bit of different dynamic here. We try to tailor our app as much as possible to this ad audience in terms of uh, the content, and we're currently working quite a lot in terms of aligning the design of the app and the content and all of that to various uh, guidances from various regulators related to the age-appropriate design, if you've probably heard of such such things. Uh, in the UK, there is one. Uh, there are lots of specific guidances and regulations uh, enacted across the globe. So we heavily rely on those, but as with anything, it's it's a journey, right? You cannot do it like in one day. 
So I think you actually, you, you touched on uh, my next question, which is we'd like to end each episode with a look forward. So what is next for Flow? In big picture, what are you really thinking about? What should our listeners expect to see in this larger data health mobile space? So um, I'm going to ask you, you both to predict the future. It's very hard to predict the future, <laughs> especially, you know, like in a modern world when it's very dynamic, but I think what will continue to exercise its industry leading practices, you know, like encryption of the data, regular third party audits of our data privacy and security practices. Recently, we finished ISO certification, ISO 27001 certification. We hope to do the same for privacy ISO. Yeah. So privacy standard from ISO. We want to move as much features as possible to anonymous mode. And also to, we want to make anonymous mode default by for all users kind of, yeah, it will take some time to kind of bridge the gap between, you know, like anonymous mode and normal mode and kind of, we're still not sure how to implement this properly because there are a lot of uh, technical challenges around this, but our dream is to have one kind of super private mode for all users by default from day one. And this is our dream and this is where we, we work on this. And I think first step will be to implement Oblivious HTTP for all users, not only for anonymous users, but again, as I said, it will take some time to, to implement properly. Yeah, and just to add on top of what Roman has just said, we really want to be an example for the industry on privacy and security uh, in terms of measures, in terms of approach, in terms of compliance efforts. And that entails a lot of different activities from what has just Roman referenced, uh, technical privacy to being able, for example, to align all our practices and, and policies to renowned international standards such as ISO 27701, for example. Great. Well, thank you both. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. This has been a, uh, an awesome conversation and an, and an interesting one. Yes, I've definitely learned a few things myself. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in to this latest episode of Privacy Abbreviated. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Please leave us a review and let us know what you'd like to hear about next on Privacy Abbreviated.